Five Books and Counting, The Tales from the Omni Vault continues to expand as a universe. Go ahead and check the links down in the description to get your copies today. Hello ladies and gentlemen, I am the Omni Viewer, and we are eight episodes into Monarch Legacy of Monsters at this point. The previous episode, the seventh one, I stated was not really a good one. I've been following the series up to this point, and I've been trying to remain either neutral on certain things, or I've recognized where the show has done something well. For a lot of stuff, I recognize that it's being told in a serialized format, which means it's not episodic, every episode is building towards one thing, so there's certain stuff I couldn't make judgments on just yet, because I have yet to see how they fully play out. But as we're getting closer to the ending, more stuff is actually starting to come together. We're actually starting to see more in the way of payoff. And <sighs> episode 7 was not really a good one. It felt like something was missing. Certain characters changed rather drastically. Certain implied connections were sort of coming out of nowhere. And th there wasn't really anything in it that felt... Uh, it, it was. It just felt like it was a step down in terms of quality from what I'd been seeing up to that point. Prior to then, I was on board with Monarch, seeing where it was going. It maybe wasn't blowing me out of the water, but I wasn't like, ew, no, get it away from me. Not like with the Skull Island series or anything. But Episode 7 felt like it was inferior to what came before. Now, Episode 8 is kind of a return to the quality of the previous episodes in some ways, but I don't really know if it's better. In fact, between this episode and my reflections on everything that's come before, because, you know, as we're starting to tie all the loose ends together, I'm also starting to look back and think about what came previously, I've actually come to some realizations that are making me kind of rethink my feelings about this series. So, I will point out a few things that the series, the, the episode, I mean, this particular episode did well. I mean, Kurt Russell's still giving a good performance, and I actually think he did the best job in this episode. Uh, that I especially like that moment where he's talking to Kate, and when he... When she asks why he wants to talk to her specifically, he said, you looked into his eyes, his being Godzilla's. You know he's not just a mindless force of nature. He knows what he's doing. That right there solidifies that there's at least an understanding of how Godzilla's supposed to work here. And, you know, I can appreciate that. I can appreciate when we acknowledge that the monsters do actually have personalities. And the episode also at least tries to get him back to the Shaw we recognize from the previous episodes, and not the spontaneously evil character he was in the past episode. So, there's at least that. Um, it also seems to ignore the hints that Kate and May might be getting together, but uh, then again, it could also be that there just wasn't any opportunity for that to happen this time around. Before the show is over, who knows. But ultimately, it does kind of feel like Monarch is taking a bit of a nosedive. It's, uh, well, I said that a large part of what I'm thinking right now involves not just this episode, but also my reflections on previous episodes. So perhaps I should explain that. Now, as I'm looking back at different episodes, I'm trying to see, like, what different things they set up that could possibly connect to what's going to happen before the series ends, because they've got to start tying things together, and like I said, they have. I'm starting to look back and realize that this series has not depicted Monarch in the best light, and I'm not just talking about the fact that it started off by showing them as a sinister conspiracy. What I mean is that in this series, Monarch comes across as especially incompetent. Like, 
in the movies, which, like I said in previous videos, that is the primary source material here. In the movies, Monarch is shown to be fairly on the ball. You know, they've got the cutting-edge technology, they've got outposts all over the world that are containing these different monsters with measures in place to keep them contained and, if necessary, kill them. They've got stacks of research based on what they've been able to figure out. And sure, they don't always know everything, but you, you never get the sense that when they fail, it's from lack of trying. It's more because something happened that they couldn't possibly have expected. Like in the Janjira plant in Godzilla 2014, they had everything in place to keep the male Mudo contained, and they had a system in place that they were pretty certain would kill it. And when they tried, it seemed to work, but ultimately it failed. It's not because they screwed up, it's because they underestimated what they were dealing with, which is a basic human error. Beyond that, though, they're good at monitoring, they're good at containing, they have the means to engage with the monsters and help evacuate civilians if necessary. But here, in the series, they're being painted as, well, as uh, Shaw puts it, an organization that just sits on their hands and does nothing. They're making it seem like Monarch actively doesn't do anything. And when they are trying to do something, they're really bad at it. Like I said, in the movies, they're tracking monsters. They've got them contained in different outposts all over the world. In Legacy of Monsters, they can't even track down one guy. And okay, fine. Hiroshi Ronda faked his death. Maybe he could be able to skirt by them that way. But with Shaw, you would think that since they've had him locked up and they've been, like, psychoanalyzing him and everything, you'd think they would know how, where he would be going. Like, gee, where on earth could he possibly be going? Maybe to this place where the woman he cared about was brutally murdered by monsters? That could be a thing, but instead they're just like, hmm, he could be anywhere and we just don't know. What do these random civilians we brought in think? We'll listen to them. Say what you want about the characters in King of the Monsters. Lord knows plenty of people have. But at the very least, when they brought Mark Russell in as a consultant, he was former monarch, and he had plenty of experience that would speak to the idea that he knows what he's talking about. Meanwhile, in Legacy of Monsters, Monarch can barely do anything right, and this episode actually draws attention to that. May says that Monarch kinda sucks at everything that they're doing, which I suppose was an attempt at being self-aware, but in reality just makes it feel like they're drawing attention to a problem that they know exists but haven't done anything about. Just because you hang a lampshade on it doesn't mean you've actually fixed anything. And as a result, this does kind of feel like the series is... I'm not sure what the series is actually trying to say at this point. Because, again, this doesn't feel like the monarch in the movies. You know, there's actually something we can do as a line of comparison. Let's look back at the Marvel Cinematic Universe, back when it was still good. During Phase 2, one of the things they started doing was branching out from the movies. They not only had the continued movie portion of it, of course, but they also started doing shows, particularly Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which aired on ABC. And yes, it was officially meant to be canon to the MCU. I know that more recently... The word has come down from on high that the only stuff that's canon to the MCU are the movies themselves, and stuff like the Netflix shows and whatnot are not supposed to be canon anymore. And in some cases, I guess that's okay. Like, I don't think anybody wants to remember Inhumans, and I'm sorry for reminding those of you who forgot. But originally, it was all meant to be one thing. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was specifically designed to be part of the MCU. You can even tell when it's supposed to take place in relation to the movies. Early in the first half of Season 1, 
the events of Thor the Dark World just happened. And during the second half of season one, the events of Captain America the Winter Soldier happen. Which also leads to, of course, S.H.I.E.L.D. dissolves in that movie, but from every season onward in the show, S.H.I.E.L.D. is sort of restructured into a more underground black ops unit with a lower budget to accommodate the lower budget of the show itself. But also, this helps explain stuff like why Agent Coulson can still be alive and going all over the place without any of the Avengers finding out about it, because, you know, his death in the first Avengers movie was kind of a big deal. But the thing is, this version of S.H.I.E.L.D. that was presented in the series still felt like S.H.I.E.L.D. The stuff that occurred within the show and the way the characters behaved all felt consistent with the movies. It didn't feel, at least not at first, like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was some disparate idea that might be part of the MCU, but ultimately wasn't. In fact, they went to great lengths to ensure that there were no continuity errors, which they fell off of that after a certain point, but I stopped watching around the time that the Infinity War came along because I actually thought the show was over by then. It felt like an ending, but that's off topic. Point is, when the MCU did a series that took their big organization from the movies and shone the spotlight directly on it, there was consistency there. It still felt like the shield we knew from the movies. Here, in the MonsterVerse, the monarch of the movies does not feel like the monarch of the show. And that is going to be a problem long term. This is why I created that canon tier list in a, a few weeks ago. Because we're going to be looking at how all of this lines up. And right now we do have a pretty glaring discrepancy here. It's not necessarily something to do with the timeline or when a character is supposed to be in a certain place at a certain time or something. It's more about a depiction of something, how a particular thing is portrayed. And right now, Monarch is not lining up with the movies. It could still be fixed by the end. I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt until I see the final episode, which, depending on how things go, might also be the final episode, if you catch me. But... I'm going to give it at least the, that much. If by the time we get to the end and I'm like, wow, that actually didn't work out well in any way, then, well, oh well, I guess. But on the other hand, like I said, it could still patch things up by the end. It could have some kind of brilliant revelation by the final episode that makes me go, oh, of course, this explains everything. Who knows, we might actually have a cameo by Ken Watanabe himself stepping into Sarazawa and going, All right, what have you all been doing while I was gone? Because I'm not pleased. And, like, that could potentially solve it, or maybe it'll be something else. But, like, at the moment, I'm starting to rethink things. I, I don't think Monarch is, like, as terrible as the Skull Island series. That was pretty much bad right out of the gate. But Monarch is certainly not as strong as it could be. So I'm hoping it picks up again, but at this point, I'm uncertain. And apparently next week, we will potentially be following some characters into the Hollow Earth. All the way down... Well, hopefully not, because, again, the movies made it pretty clear that while you can get to certain areas that are beneath the surface of the Earth, which are technically Hollow Earth, you can't get all the way down into the very center without some serious technological assistance. So if they do somehow get all the way down there, I mean, th then the show will have officially written itself out of the canon. But... Can't make a judgment on that yet. We'll just have to see what happens. But by this point, that'll be next year. So, until such time as we meet again, this is the Omni Viewer signing off.
Thank you all for watching. Now be sure to head down to the description to check us out on other platforms as well as find links to the five current books in the Tales from the Omni Vault universe. Again, thank you all and we'll see you next time.